Lighthouse Scientific Education presents a lecture in the gas series. The topic, the basics of gas. Material in this lecture relies on understanding of the previous lectures, fundamental properties of matter, dimensional analysis, temperature, and the mole as a quantity. Gas is a broad subject. Prior to the beginning of this lecture, an overview of the subject matter covered in the gas series of lectures is given. This particular lecture begins with a general overview of gases, with an introduction to the concept of an ideal gas, and then it is on to a discussion of gases particles with an introduction to the kinetic molecular theory. The four basic properties of gases are presented and then explained in more detail. The properties are amount, temperature, volume, along with some conversions between volume unit types, and pressure, along with some conversions between pressure unit types. And finally, we'll talk a bit about the standard temperature and pressure. There are four lectures in the gas series of lectures, including this one, The Basics of Gas. Its contents were just listed. The second lecture in the series covers the fundamentals of gas laws. Expect to find names like Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, as well as the Combined Gas Law. The third lecture is also a gas law lecture. It is called Gas Law, One Condition. The all-important ideal gas law is discussed, as well as Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. The final lecture is Gas Advanced Concepts. Topics in this lecture may or may not be covered to much depth in your course. The lecture is presented for those students whose instructor does delve deeper into the kinetic molecular theory or expects some understanding of diffusion and effusion. There is one more advanced topic involving gases that is not covered in this series of lectures. That is, stoichiometry involving gases. It is presented in the lecture Stoichiometry Advanced Concepts, which is found in the Stoichiometry series of lectures. It covers stoichiometry using molar volume and the ideal gas law. Now, to an overview of gases. By now we are familiar with gas being a state of matter, and that gas particles are in random motion, and that motion is fast and fluid. Gas particles speed up when heated. Unlike solids, gases have no defined shape. The gas particles themselves occupy very little volume, but travel within all available space. Gas expands into its surroundings. Gas particles exert pressure on their surroundings. Gas is readily compressible, unlike liquids and solids. As such, its density is a small fraction of that of a solid or a liquid. Gases form homogeneous solutions. That is, they mix completely with other gases, and they do so in all proportions. Gases are miscible. What about intermolecular forces? Do gas particles form dipole-dipole or experience London dispersion forces, such as those seen in liquids and solids? Well, gases undergo chemistry, so the answer has to be yes. On the other hand, when dealing with the properties of a gas, Gas particles can be treated like rapidly moving and colliding tiny balls that have few to no intermolecular interactions. So, if they are not undergoing chemical reactions, they are modeled like colliding balls. There is a model for treating gases like that. It is called an ideal gas. Ideal because it is theoretical and not a completely accurate portrayal of a gas. Still, in many instances, it does stand in quite well for a real gas, and it is quite useful for developing a basic understanding of gases. An ideal gas consists of randomly moving particles that collide but do not interact. More specifically, the model has three basic assumptions. The first is that a gas is composed of particles. These particles can be compounds or atoms. They are thought of as small, hard spheres that have no volume and do not participate in intermolecular interactions. An analogy is billiard balls on a pool table. The balls collide with each other, 
but there's no sticking together or alteration to their size or shape. The second assumption is that the particles in the gas move rapidly and are in constant random motion. They move in straight lines and only change their direction upon collisions. After collisions, they will move in a new straight line until the next collision. Collisions of a gas are said to be perfectly elastic. That is, upon collision, the energy of motion is transferred without loss. In the billiard ball analogy, when a break occurs at the start of a game, the energy of the cue ball is transferred into the motion of the other balls. No energy is lost. It is only communicated to the other balls. These three assumptions of an ideal gas form the basis of a powerful model for reasoning out gas behavior. It is called the Kinetic Molecular Theory, or KMT. The purpose of the KMT is to provide an understanding of gases as particles. That understanding comes from a few basic attributes of the model which follow straight from an ideal gas. At the foundation of the model is the reasonable proposition that a gas consists of a large number of particles. The particles move in constant random straight line motion. They speed up when heated. Particles are separated by large distances which means that gases are mostly empty space, and the particles can be treated as essentially taking up none of that space. That is, the volume of the gas particle is so much smaller than the volume of the container holding the gas that the volume of the particles can be neglected. The gas particles are moving so fast that there's essentially no intermolecular interaction. And finally, particles make elastic collisions with each other and with the walls of their container. The KMT is an ideal gas theory and a lens to bring gas behavior into focus. We can use these considerations to build an understanding of the four basic properties of gases. Specifically, we will use the KMT considerations when asking the broad question, what properties are needed to describe a gas? And the follow-up question, what would increase the number of collisions that a gas makes with the sides of its container? Both of these questions help us form a behavioral understanding of gases. The most obvious answer to what would increase the number of collisions is an increase in the number of particles. That is the property of amount, as in the number of moles of gas lowercase n. Quite simply, more particles leads to more collisions. More cars on the road leads to more collisions. Another factor that increases the number of collisions is the speed of the particle. That property is temperature, capital T. Increasing the temperature, hotter particles, means faster moving particles, and that leads to more collisions. And then there's the factor of the size of the container. The property is volume, capital V. With a smaller container, the sides of the wall are going to be closer together. It takes less time for the gas particles to reach the side, and that means they will collide with the side more often. Larger containers see less collisions because particles have farther to travel. The last property is found with the third question. What is the measure of collisions with the side of the container? It is called pressure. More collisions is higher pressure. As we will see later, harder collisions are also higher pressure. Pressure is the only one of these properties that is a result of the other properties. By focusing on pressure, we can reason out the roles of the other properties in gas behavior. So these are our four properties, amount, temperature, volume, and pressure, N, T, V, and P. Understanding these properties is essential to understanding gas. Let's look a little closer at each one in turn, beginning with amount. Like most areas in chemistry, the study of gas uses the mole as a unit of amount. Amount is either given in moles or converted into moles. Remember, one mole of particles is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Some textbooks do not use 6.022, but rather 6.02. Not a big deal. 
use the one from your textbooks. Moles can be gotten from mass or weight with the atomic or molar mass. Making this type of conversion is a necessary skill at this point in our studies. The variable n is used to represent the number of moles. The next property is temperature, T. Let's take a step back, refamiliarize ourselves with what we learned in the temperature lecture in the Introduction to Chemistry series of lectures. It stated that the components of matter, be they atom or compound, are in constant motion. That is true for solids, liquids, or gases. Importantly, motion is energy, and motion energy is a form of heat. They are linked. More motion comes from more heat. Now to temperature. Temperature is a measurement of that amount of heat. Higher temperatures mean more heat and faster gas particles. From a collision perspective, the faster a particle moves, the more often it will collide and the harder it collides. Faster moving gives rise to higher pressure. Conversely, cooling a gas down will slow the particles and reduce the temperature and pressure, all things being equal. Also from the temperature lecture, we saw that there are different temperature scales. These scales all measure the same heat, but do so with different size increments. The most common scale in the United States is the Fahrenheit scale. This older scale has the freezing point of water at 32 degrees F and the boiling point of water at 212 degrees F. The most widely used scale is Celsius. It was designed so that the temperature at which water freezes is 0 degrees Celsius and the temperature of boiling will be 100 degrees Celsius. The temperature scale for science is Kelvin. It is the absolute scale of temperature, with the lowest possible temperature being 0 K. No degree sign with Kelvin. All chemistry calculations use the Kelvin scale, but temperature is almost always measured in Fahrenheit or Celsius. Conversion between temperature scales is covered in detail in the temperature lecture. Briefly, the interconversion between Celsius and Kelvin uses the following two equations. To convert from Celsius into Kelvin, take the temperature in Celsius and add 273.15. To convert from Kelvin into Celsius, take the temperature in Kelvin and subtract 273.15. The next property is the well-known quantity volume. Its scientific definition is that volume is the quantity of three-dimensional space enclosed by a boundary. The boundary can be real or made up, arbitrary. The volume of gas is not the volume of the gas particles, but rather the volume available to the particles as they zip around in random motion. Within any volume, the actual gas particles will occupy very little that available volume, but the particles travel within all available space. Gas expands to fill the volume containing it. It is important to make the distinction between the volume of the particles and the volume of the available space. KMT has the volume of particles as zero, so any discussion involving volume will be referring to the available space. Volume is discussed in more detail in the density in the lab lecture in the Introduction to Chemistry series. Briefly, volume has three dimensions. For a rectangular box, those are labeled length, width, and height. If each is measured in meters, then the units of volume are cubed meters, three-dimensional. The SI, or standard international unit for volume, is cubic meters. But there are other commonly used types of units besides cubic meters. There is cubic centimeters and cubic decimeters. These are all length-based measurements and are used when they are appropriate for the size of the volume of interest. Another common type of volume unit is the liter. It is given the unit designation L. It can be an upper or lowercase L and sometimes it is italicized. Here's a smaller liter unit, the milliliter. 
all of the units are three-dimensional representations of volume. Sometimes it will be necessary to move from one type of volume unit to another type. Fortunately, there are well-established relationships between most of these unit types. Perhaps the most useful is that one mil is equal to one centimeter cubed. This allows for the conversion between volume measurements one might get from a graduated cylinder to those from a ruler. And there are metric conversions within a unit type, such as one liter equals 1,000 mils. Combining these two equalities gives another very helpful conversion. One liter equals 1,000 cubic centimeters. It should be noted that the metric conversion with cubic length measurements can be a bit tricky since it's really a three-step dimensional analysis problem. It takes a million cubic centimeters to make one cubic meter, even though it only takes 100 centimeters to make a meter. We'll get to that issue momentarily. This list is nowhere near complete. There are many other kinds of relationships between different volume unit types including all the common U.S. variety, such as ounces, pints, quarts, and gallons. Still, all conversions between different unit types use the standard conversion practice as covered in the dimensional analysis lecture. If a student is given a volume of one centimeter cubed and asked to convert that to volume in liters, a relationship is needed between the current or have units of centimeters cubed and the desired or wanted units of liters. When inserted into the equation as a conversion factor with current or have units in the denominator, the conversion can be made. Another slightly more complicated example has that same one cubic centimeter as the given unit, but cubic meters as the desired or wanted units. A relationship is needed between the have units of cubic centimeters and the wanted units of meters. Inserting this relationship as a conversion factor with cubic centimeters in the denominator and canceling units will complete the conversion. But what would happen if this particular relationship was not available to the student? The answer is that a simpler, more common relationship can be used, such as the metric conversion of 1 meter to 100 centimeters. The problem here is that the given units are in cubic centimeters. As written, this conversion factor will not completely cancel out with the cubic centimeters. That can be remedied by the addition of two more of the same conversion factors. Taken as a whole, the three centimeter units of the conversion factors cancel out with the three centimeter units of the cubed centimeter in the given units. That is why the metric conversion within the cubic length measurement can be a bit tricky. The fourth property, and the one that is really just a combination of the first three properties, is pressure. Understanding how the other three properties affect pressure will give us a handle on the more advanced topic of gas law. Broadly speaking, pressure is a force exerted by a substance on another substance. This force is over some specific area. The formula of pressure is force over area, F over A. Pressure is directly proportional to force. A stronger force generates a stronger pressure. A weaker force produces a weaker pressure. In the context of a gas, the force is generated by the gas particles colliding with the sides of its confinement or container, or really anything they strike. Relating this definition of pressure, the gas is the first substance that exerts a force on another substance, which is the size of the container. So, a gas can generate a higher pressure through a change in the other three properties. This can be viewed from the perspective of how changing those properties alters the force exerted by the gas, or the area over which the gas exerts that force. Looking at the role of force first, according to the equation, if force goes up, then pressure goes up. Force will go up if the number of particles is increased. If there are more particles, there are more collisions with the wall. More collisions is more force. More force is more pressure. And then there's temperature. 
If heat is added, the temperature will go up and the particles will have more motion. The particles will be moving faster. Faster particles make more collisions. Faster particles also strike the side of the container harder. Harder collisions exert more force. Taken together, adding heat increases the temperature, increases the force, increases the pressure. Then there is area. According to the pressure equation, area and pressure are inversely proportional. That is, if one goes down, the other goes up. The lone property that affect area is volume. As volume goes down, area goes down, and pressure goes up. Decreasing the volume shrinks the area of the container and decreases the distance between the walls. With less distance to travel before reaching the walls, the particles will in effect strike the wall more often. More collisions, more force, more force, higher pressure. Pressure can be thought of as a reflection of the number of collisions with the walls of the container. For completion's sake, we will ask the opposite question. How can pressure be lowered? Starting again with force and noting that according to the equation, if the force goes down, then the pressure goes down. Force will go down if the number of particles is decreased. If there are less particles, then there will be less collisions with the wall. When temperatures decrease, that is, heat is removed, the particles will be moving slower and there will be less collisions with the walls of the container. Those fewer collisions will also be softer, for lack of a better word, than those of faster moving particles. Think of being struck by a baseball. Which one would hurt more, the ball moving fast or the ball moving slow? Slower particles have less force. As for area, the pressure equation says that as the area goes up, the pressure will go down. Area increases with an increasing volume. A large volume means that the walls of the container are farther away and gas particles have further to travel before striking the wall. That decreases the number of collisions with the wall. Less collisions is a lower force which produces a lower pressure. The take home lesson for pressure is that the amount, temperature, and volume affect the number of collisions, and that in turn affects the pressure. Getting a good grasp of pressure is so important to our understanding of gas that we will further our exploration. A common way to demonstrate pressure is with a cylinder and piston. Shown here is a cylinder that is sealed at the bottom. Toward the top is a disc or piston that snugly fits into the cylinder. It is assumed that any gas beneath the piston cannot escape out of the cylinder. In this cartoon representation, there is some volume of gas in the cylinder under the piston. The gas particles in the cylinder are rapidly bouncing around and exerting a pressure on the sides of their confinement and, importantly, on the underside of the piston. In this example, we will say that the pressure exerted by the gas is one atmosphere. We will get to the units of pressure shortly. Question. Why doesn't that one atmosphere of pressure push the piston up the cylinder? The answer is that while there is a force on the piston from the gas in the cylinder, there is also air from the atmosphere pushing down on the cylinder from above. With gases, the pressure of the air often has to be considered. The bottom line is that the piston doesn't move because the force on top is matched or is equal to or is countered by the force exerted by the gas below in the cylinder. To keep the example as simple as possible, we will pretend that the piston itself has no mass and therefore no weight. Weight would also be a force pushing down. Now, if the external pressure was to increase, it's shown as two atmospheres here, the piston would move because the top pressure would be greater than the pressure inside the cylinder. It would decrease the volume available to our sample of gas, which we just saw would effectively increase the pressure of the gas. The piston would move until the pressure on top of the piston is equal to the pressure exerted by the gas in the cylinder on the bottom of the piston. 
This example would not work if there was a liquid or solid in the cylinder. Gases are compressible. We can take this understanding of pressure and bring in the mercury barometer. The barometer is a device that is used to measure atmospheric pressure. In fact, the suffix baro means pressure. It should be pointed out here that our air is a collection of gases that exerts a force on us and everything else as if we were the walls of a container. We do not sense that pressure, but it most certainly is there, and the barometer will show us just how strong it is. A basic barometer has a pool of mercury, Hg. Modern barometers use an alcohol, but the principle is the same. Inserted into the pool is an evacuated tube. All the air has been removed. It is empty or close to it. Exposing the barometer to the atmosphere has air molecules colliding with the pool of mercury, just like they collide with everything else they come in contact with. The force of these collisions has the effect of pushing down on the surface of the mercury so that some of the mercury gets pushed up the empty tube. The larger the atmospheric pressure, the greater the push, and the higher the mercury will climb up the tube. At some point, the weight of the mercury, due to gravity, equals the pressure exerted by the atmosphere, and the mercury stops rising. Therefore, the distance from the top of the pool of mercury to the top of the column of mercury is an indicator of the atmospheric pressure. Usually, the distance is given in millimeters. In essence, the barometer is equating the force due to weight of the mercury, as measured by the height of the column of mercury, to the force exerted by the collision of gas particles on the pool of mercury. More collisions mean more force, which is compensated by more weight from more mercury in the tube. The atmospheric pressure at sea level pushes the column of mercury to 760 millimeters. Uh, 760 millimeters is called the standard pressure. Sea level is the standard altitude for pressure, and like all standards, it is just an agreed upon amount. Noting that the atmosphere thins with increasing altitude, it follows that the atmospheric pressure at the top of a mountain is less than it is at sea level. Like most types of measurements, there are different units that can be used to describe the measurements. For example, that 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere of pressure. And that brings us to our next topic regarding pressure. Units. There are a number of different units that are used to describe pressure. The different units are all measuring the same pressure, but they are presenting it in different ways. Let's compare the more common unit types. We just saw the unit of millimeters of mercury. The units are a height measurement in millimeters. As a pressure unit, it is mmHg. Standard sea level pressure for this unit is 760 millimeters. A similar unit is Tor. It is named after Torselli, the co-inventor of the barometer. It is abbreviated as Tor, and it shares the same increment as millimeters of mercury. Standard pressure, 760 Tor is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. The two only differ in name. Another prominent scientist in the development of the barometer is Pascal. He too gets a unit named after him. Its units are newtons over meter square. It is a force, newtons, per area, square meter scheme. It is abbreviated PA, or if the scale is multiplied by 1000, KPA. The K is for kilo. And as we see here, that same standard pressure is given with a more complicated series of numbers. Pascals and kilopascals are not particularly common unit at this level of chemistry. What is common is the atmosphere. It is abbreviated ATM, and it is a unit defined as being one standard pressure. That is convenient. The last unit type of pressure is the most commonly used scale in the U.S. It is pounds per square inch. It too has a force pounds per area square inch unit, and its abbreviation is PSI. The standard pressure 
and PSI is 14.1. The nice thing about this table is that since each type of pressure unit is given at that same standard pressure, all values in this column are equal to each other. 700 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere. And when an equality is made, a unit factor can be made. 700 millimeters of mercury over one atmosphere is a conversion factor between denominations of the pressure unit. This ratio can just as easily have atmospheres in the numerator and millimeters of mercury in the denominator. Any pair of values in the column can be made into an equality and a unit factor. 760 torr over 14.1 psi is equal to 1 and it is a conversion factor. Same goes for atmospheres and pascals. These unit factors are central in the conversion of pressure units. Pressure conversions are a common homework or test problem in the early study of gases. Say we're asked to convert 570 millimeters of mercury into an equivalent amount of atmospheres. Our standard approach is to start with what the problem gives as the current units and through a conversion factor transform that value into the desired or asked for units. In this particular problem, 570 millimeters of mercury is the current or given units and atmospheres is the desired or asked for units. The conversion factor will need to be oriented such that the current units are in the denominator and the desired units in the numerator. In this orientation, the current units will cancel out, leaving the desired units. To get the appropriate unit factor, we return to the list of pressure units. Find the current and desired units in the column of standard pressure. These values are equal to each other and can be made into a unit factor. Of particular importance is to arrange the ratio such that the current units are in the denominator. That is not the case with this unit factor. The current units in our problem are millimeters of mercury, not atmospheres. No problem. Simply flip the ratio over and the correct conversion factor is obtained. Once this unit factor is inserted, the problem reduces to some calculator work. Units of mercury cancel out and 570 divided by 760 is 0 0.750. 570 millimeters of mercury is the same pressure as 0 0.750 atmospheres. One more. What is 100 kilopascals expressed in TOR. The current unit is the 100 kilopascals and the desired unit is TOR. What is the unit factor that allows this conversion? Returning to the table of pressure units, identify the units in the conversion in the standard pressure column, TOR and kilopascal. Be sure to get the appropriate pascal unit. With these units, create a unit factor with the current units of kilopascals in the denominator so that they cancel out. 100 kilopascals is the same pressure as 752 torr. The last topic of this lecture is something called standard temperature and pressure, STP. Standard temperature and pressure is an agreed upon set of common values, the P in STP was covered in the standard pressure column of the units table. We saw that one atmosphere is an exact value for standard pressure. In fact, that is how it was defined. It can just as rightly be given as 760 millimeters of mercury. The standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. That too is an exact figure. It corresponds to 273.15 Kelvin to five significant figures. An important relationship at STP is that one mole of gas occupies 22.4 liters. It doesn't matter what the gas is. This relationship between amount and volume is called molar volume. To restate, at STP, a gas has a temperature of 273.15 Kelvin, its pressure is one atmosphere, and one mole of the gas occupies 22.4 liters. A quick note, molar volume is not limited to the temperature and pressure at STP. 
it can be thought of as moles per liter of that gas. Recapping the lecture, gas is a state of matter. Gas particles are fast moving and occupy very little volume. That is, they physically occupy a small amount of the volume available to them. Gas form homogeneous solutions. They mix completely with other gases. Gases are miscible. One of the most helpful ways to consider gas is with the kinetic molecular theory, KMT. It is built on the assumptions of an ideal gas. One, gas is comprised of particles. Those particles are considered small, hard spheres. They occupy no volume, and they do not participate in intermolecular interactions. Two, particles in a gas move rapidly in constant random motion. They move in straight lines and only change direction upon collision. Three, these collisions are perfectly elastic. There is no energy loss in the collision. Gases can be described using four properties. One, amount. This is the number of particles in moles. Two, temperature, the measure of heat. Heat is motion and temperature is proportional to the speed of particles. Gas chemistry calculations use the Kelvin scale for temperature. Three, volume, that is three-dimensional space available to the gas. It is the size of the container holding the gas. And four, pressure. It is the force exerted by a substance per unit area on another substance. For gases, it can be rationalized from the perspective of collisions of the gas particle with the size of the container. Finally, standard temperature and pressure, STP. It is a gas at zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure. At STP, one mole of gas occupies 22.4 liters, molar volume. And that concludes our lecture. Remember, gases can be viewed from the perspective of collisions. <laughs>